live everywhere. Daily Co's Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walker, K Grow in the Morning Show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? I've been struck by coronavirus. That's why I couldn't get the microphone to turn on. Uh, well, you know what? I decided uh, we don't really need a microphone. We'll just uh, we'll buy one immediately prior to the show. I hate seeing microphones just standing around doing nothing. Yes, it is Thursday, February 27th, 2020. A great day for digesting the, I guess, sort of press conference that the president, I guess, sort of the president, sort of held yesterday to sort of discuss the coronavirus and government efforts to help slow its spread, as we'll be reminded later on by Greg Dworkin. That's all we can do. We can't guarantee anything, <clears throat> and we can't stop anything. I don't think it's capable of, uh, I don't think the response, any response really is capable of that. We'll find out why. When we speak to Greg later on, and uh, it was really a remarkable performance, of course, uh, pretty much what everybody expected, I think, <clears throat> that uh, Trump would get up there and attempt to take a leadership type role and do so incompetently. And uh, congratulations to all of us who predicted that. The only surprise for me from the press conference was that he didn't force a bunch of doctors to be there in their lab coats and dress up in, in order to play doctor like central casting would have them do it stethoscopes white lab coats and then uh, we'll have to ask actually <clears throat> i thought i would ask greg what's the name of that strange mirror thingy that uh, old-timey doctors in stock photos would wear up on their foreheads uh except it's got a very well i don't know as far as i know it's got no exciting uh name that makes it sound like a complicated piece of equipment it's 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 a mirror, and you wear it on your head, <clears throat> and it's a head mirror, which is amazing because uh, I guess somewhere along the line they just lost their minds and named something medical something that everybody would understand. I don't know whether that's the real name for it or not, but that's what came up when I searched. What is the name of that old-timey thing that doctors sort of wore on their heads and would put over their eyes when they were examining stuff? And the answer that uh, Wikipedia came up with was head mirror, so... That's it. Oh, look. And as I say it, Greg Dworkin uh, sends me the note that, yeah, here's an article on it. They're in Wikipedia. They're called head mirrors. So no wonder they got rid of those things. You can't, how can you bill thousands of dollars for something called a head mirror when all it is is a mirror that goes on your head? You have to call it uh, head mirex or something like that and, we, and spell it funny. And then uh, give me a commercial with some, let's say, uh, old people enjoying life in tracksuits. Uh, and then I'll buy it and it costs several thousand dollars. This is the way modern medicine ought to be practiced, of course. Uh, Greg just wanting to take care of people and keep them healthy. That's like dinosaur stuff. We don't do that anymore. All right. Well, as you know, uh, lots to round up today. There's not only that horrible press conference, but there is, of course, the unfortunate fact of the virus behind it which uh, I'm already seeing the effects of uh, having discussed this thing with Greg and flu and other pandemic diseases in the past with Greg, where uh, it, it's the funniest thing is having conversations with people who say, what's all this panic about? I don't understand why everyone's panicking. And then the conversation gets louder and louder <clears throat> and more and more uh, stressful sounding as they insist that they're not panicking and why is everybody else panicking and I'm so annoyed about all these people panicking and what are we going to do about these people who are panicking and they're panicking and they're ruining everything in the stock market and, then, and now I have to go out and get bottled water because of not because I'm panicking but because they're panicking and I won't be able to get water because they're going to panic and take all the water and I really don't know what to do and it's really making me upset but not panicked I guess uh, so I'm running into this uh, wherever I go and uh, all right, well, we'll see what uh, what there is to take away from yesterday's press conference. The president was absolutely horrible, said next to nothing except things that could only make things worse. And basically, you know, it, like an unstudied moron got up there, a kid unprepared for his book report and uh, and says uh, such valuable scientific insights as in some ways 
it's a little harder than flu, but in some ways it's a little easier, don't you think? And uh, we should treat it like flu, except somehow different. So it's a little bit the same and it's a little bit different. Uh, he was also astonished to find, I'm not 100% sure whether he was astonished to find that people die each year of the flu or whether it was the numbers that surprised him. Giving him the benefit of the doubt, we'll say it's the numbers. But then again, this was the guy who like seven times has said he's never heard of a Category 5 hurricane. Every time we have a, a, a hurricane that the president has to say anything about, it's probably because it's a Category 5. And he's done it a number of times, and each time he claims that he's forgotten that, or I guess we're supposed to assume that he's forgotten, but he claims he's never heard of a Category 5. And uh, anyway, he's got it all contained. And my, my, I think my favorite takeaway was uh, the businessman in the White House innovation. Everybody who's ever been saying we need a businessman in the White House, we found out what that actually means now. That means you take all the latest buzzword uh, business magazine terminology and apply it to governmental uh, operations. We're now going to have just-in-time staffing for virologists at the CDC. Whenever there's a pandemic, we'll hire back some people and we'll ask them what it is and where to get the vaccine. That's all that's necessary. The statement yesterday, uh, questioned by a member of the press, you uh, are now in the middle of pandemic prepare, preparation and you've been calling for enormous cuts at uh, National Health and at uh, the, the International Institutes of Health and the CDC, et cetera. And his answer was, I hate seeing people stand around with nothing to do all day, getting paid, doing nothing. We'll hire them when we need them. It's very easy to get them. We'll just hire them. In fact, he, he insisted that other countries are calling him, asking very politely, could we please have some of your experts? That's how many. We got experts coming out of our butts here. So we just throw them away and send them elsewhere. All right. So Greg is here and he knows about pandemics. And uh, maybe we'll let him talk or maybe we just let Trump go for another half hour like me. Hi, good morning, well, Greg. Hey, good morning. So Don Moynihan, who's a public management professor, hmm. uh, notes that once you've gutted institutional capacity, you can't, in fact, quickly restore it. Um, I mean, I think about opposite. it. It's like trying to build a, a fire engine uh, station, a fire station in the middle of a fire. Well, We didn't need it, so I got rid of it, but I need it now. So sure. uh, let's just do a crash course on building one yeah. while okay. my house burns down. You should build it immediately adjacent to the fire and not in the middle. And that's the big problem with business. Ah, but we'll get today. to the business mind. OK. Yes. So Moynihan says, just to add perspective, the business mastermind who says you can easily hire virologists currently has a college student going through his own hires to figure out who dislikes him. <laughs> that's true. We do have to make sure the doctors like him. So, you know, he's an expert on personnel. And this gets back to something that an old friend of mine, uh, a venture capitalist, uh, told me I once. Am. Uh, which is that when you're looking from a business perspective at any entity, any enterprise, personnel are always a cost. Yeah. Uh, profits a plus. So in Trump's mind, what you do is you fire everybody, collect the profits, uh, declare bankruptcy, walk away, and it's a, a win lose. But I'm the one that wins, and you lose. So what? <laughs> well, right. Uh, I mean that that's his whole way of thinking about this. And so, of course, he fired everybody because they weren't doing anything. Right. But you don't close fire stations Except, no, they were. because there's no fire at the moment oh. yes. because when there is a fire, then you wind up with this. And that's exactly the situation that we're in. So I had a thread I put together this morning. Oh, good. Uh, I had two purposes of it. One is to look at how the media handled what Trump did, and the other is what he should have said. Oh, all right. Well, so uh, we handled whatever. a part of what he should have said yesterday when we did our risk uh, communication uh, segment. Yes, right. So people will be familiar with this, and a few of the articles I sent you are from yesterday, but uh, some are from today. So uh, this is the New York Times. Trump has a problem as the coronavirus threatens the U.S., his credibility. Even his allies worry that Mr. Trump has undermined his ability to appear presidential in a moment of national emergency. Yes, that's true. And this is true. It's it very is. true. It's extremely true. He couldn't get more true. Right? Uh, right. I think that covers it all. But there's probably more. There is. Um, you know, so some outlets are trying to normalize them because that's what they do. But at yeah. least they still try to give you the facts. So this is a Washington Post. Trump downplays risk, places Pence in charge of coronavirus outbreaks. The president's positive <laughs> message was at odds with statements by top members of his administration in recent days. In recent days, the one standing next to him at the time. <laughs> it was a recent day. The that's same a recent one. Day. Okay. Some will do it better than others. This is the Hill. 
Trump accuses Pelosi of trying to create a panic on coronavirus. That's what they took from this. Uh-huh. Uh, he did. I think China. Speaker Pelosi is incompetent. Right. They thought the most important thing that happened from that conference was this. Well, they're the hill. I mean, exactly. That, that's the and hill so that wrong. tells you everything you need to know about who you should be following. Now, some will try to do the president's job for him. That's what Huffington Post did, how to prepare for a pandemic, according to U.S. health officials. The new coronavirus, COVID-19, that's not the virus, that's a disease, but that's okay, Got is it. expected to grow into a pandemic. Here's what to do before it breaks and after. It's a great piece. Uh, it'll be in your link. We could read from it later. But, uh, you know, it's basically tell, this is what the president should have told you, so we'll do it. Okay. Uh, yes. And for those who are interested... Uh, there are guides on what you can do. This is from the CDC. I think I sent it to you yesterday. It's from April 2017. Get your household ready for pandemic flu. I think the best communication masterstroke from this business genius would have been to pick up that uh, little booklet. You know, it's it's uh, eight by 11 mm. with a shiny cover and Probably take like a Sharpie that. and cross out pandemic flu and write in coronavirus with the Sharpie on TV so everybody Actually, could see it. That would have been great. And that would have been great. And he didn't, of course, because he's a jerk. But that's what he could have done to help communicate that this is relevant. And even though it's from 2017 and says pandemic flu, don't worry. The great president who everybody's watching on TV took out a Sharpie and fixed it. Right. Humorous, self-effacing even. self Exactly. It had everything. Of course, he didn't do it. Reagan. So Reagan. here's oh, two Reagan. terrific pieces, yes. two of which I gave you yesterday. Uh, one was by Ian McKay, the virologist, about... Uh, so you think we're about to be in a pandemic and uh, uh, again points out right now you're not exposed to all of this stuff, more or less, probably, for okay. the most part. Good chance. not exposed to anything. Yeah. At least this week. So if you're flying to the West Coast, don't worry about it, except for the flight attendant who had it and then uh, had to cut sick. But, you know, except for that, you know, you're good. Uh, and then this one is from The Atlantic by uh, James Hamlin, who's actually uh, an MD and a public health expert. You're likely to get the coronavirus. Most cases aren't life threatening, which is also what makes the virus a historic challenge to contain. And so that gets me to what Trump should have said. We talked about this a bit yesterday and shook it from uh, CDC, who was standing next to him, you know, the hostage. Oh, yeah. Uh, said it's not so much a question of if this will happen anymore, but rather more a question of when this will happen and how many people in the country will become infected. Dr. Shukat, uh, the CDC uh, principal deputy director, told reporters Tuesday of the disease's spread in the U.S. She said it again. Trump stepped all over that message by denying it, which is why that press conference was so harmful. Hmm. OK, he didn't just not do anything. He actually contradicted the main message that CDC was trying to tell people. Yeah, well, you shouldn't try to tell it with the president. Well, you know, he's your boss. You have ah, no choice. Yeah. Uh, I mean, again, I, I remind you of the time, you know, boss. back in 2007, 2008, when I used to take trips to CDC headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia, all the time to work on uh, uh, flu pandemic mitigation stuff. Yeah. And you walk in there and George Bush and Dick Cheney's pictures are everywhere. Fox News is on in the in the situation room. And that's the only news channel. And, you know, it's chilling. Yeah, I'm sure it is. I mean, he's probably not her boss now. She's probably even fired in between then and now for telling the truth. Well, she's a 30 year bet. I don't think she'll be fired. She's one of the, the like <laughs> real professional gems there. They can't afford to fire her right now. Do, 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 do. Next okay. week. That's another story. Anyway, since spread is more likely than not, you need to know that it's containment is to s- slow but not s- stop spread. The purpose of containment is to buy us time. And so when virus appears in the country, that's not a failure. It's a call to action. So with the time containment that it gives us, you, you beef up your medical and first responder capabilities and use the money that Schumer is offering you. Trump stepped all over that. <laughs> And said, no, 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 I can stop it. The wall will keep the virus out. Yes. And it's it's all about borders. And if this virus hits, we're going to just shut the country down. And it'll work because I told you it'll work. As a matter of fact, there's only about 10 cases in the country and they're disappearing. They'll be gone. That's basically what he said. None of it is true. Oh. None of it. And Mm -hmm. But that's what he said, which is why the markets didn't respond so well. And we know the markets didn't respond so well because he told us that – it was the Democratic debate hmm. yes. on Tuesday night right. that caused the markets to crash on Monday morning. But I think he did manage to say, but I think it was a little bit the coronavirus. A little yeah, bit. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. yeah, see, but saying stuff like that allows <laughs> the media to normalize what he's saying, right. which is absurd. 
okay? And they're terrible at it, and they really have to get their act together, and that's why they all need their mitigation strategies. Also, uh, the thing that they didn't say that they should have said and told people is that most public health is administered at state and local level. CDC is just a guiding, coordinating agency, but your state and local health departments are the ones that are going to be giving guidance to you. They'll point back to CDC and say, look at them. This is what they're saying. But it's state and local people who are conveying it locally. I mean, that, that's what they do. That's yes. their job. Uh, and that's okay. Yeah. They're the experts that we should be listening to and not Trump. Trump should have kept his mouth shut and not talked about this at all. He changed it from a public health conference to a reelection rally. Yeah. Well, that's awful. He completely politicized right. the virus. That's terrible. Everything that you want to do in risk communication, he did wrong. Mm. And so you have morons like Steve Schmidt on MSNBC saying, what a brilliant tour de force. Uh, what? Totally great politically. He put all the blame on Pelosi. I love it as a political operative. <laughs> the virus isn't even old enough to vote. I know. It's nuts. And I'm not I sure. I think, it, I think the virus Somebody isn't really independent said anyway. Somebody said that was good. There was a good press conference just in any way. That it was good. It, was, it wasn't it even was good no as political. Good in, in no way. Okay. Uh -huh. And then uh, Brian Stelter from CNN points out the president was contradicted almost in real time by some of the government experts who flanked him as he stood in the White House press briefing room, mm -hmm. which is true. Yes. So, again, I say we don't wish a coronavirus pandemic to damage his presidency. We just wish we didn't have a damaged president in charge of coronavirus. That's, that's it. That's he, incredible. he picks Mike Pence. What does Mike Pence know about this? Nothing. Uh, that's okay. Less. Because truly, the purpose of a czar is to do the bureaucratic infighting. So if you pick a politician in that role, that's fine. That's mm -hmm. not my beef. My beef is that uh, 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 Pence thinks that the best way to fight the virus is abstinence. And so, you know, it's, gonna make, it's all going to go away. And he's the guy that was partially responsible for an HIV outbreak in Indiana because he didn't believe in needle exchange. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's well, not he's the got a bad record. You want in in in, in uh, leading a uh, a public health uh, issue. Nobody trusts him. Nobody trusts Trump. And in fact, I know that for sure because there's a poll out that says so. You know, sixty oh, wow. some people trust the CDC. Ten percent trust Trump. <laughs> that's across the board. That, that that's not just Democrats. Yeah. Well, so well, so that is an example of why you don't look for politicians uh, to take out your appendix, which is mm. basically the equivalent of what's going on here. Yeah, even if they have head mirrors. Even if they have head mirrors. By the way, we don't use head mirrors anymore because no. they were for the old days when the light wasn't so good. So you take a regular old flashlight, try to look in somebody's ear, yes. and you need that head mirror to yeah. concentrate the light so that you can get a good look. Now we have very powerful, small handheld lights, so the head mirror has gone the way of the black bag and the uh, house call. Yes. You just right. see them anymore. Black bag. All right, you get them in doctor uh, costumes. At yeah, you get your doctor costume when you graduate. Uh, sexy virologist <laughs> next uh, next time okay. okay uh well yeah it sucked it was so so it really <laughs> did i mean i was furious when i was watching oh. it. he's just he's doing everything wrong yeah well and he's doing it deliberately and he's doing it to prop himself up to make himself look good and even that was stupid because the best thing to do is say this could be really serious and then nothing happens and he takes credit that's what you're supposed to mm, do as a politician yes. you're not supposed to do is say all is well or everything's fine if you want to use the current uh, you know little dog having right, a cup of coffee fine. with the house on fire meme Got it. Uh, you don't do that because that just makes you look even worse and, and pretty much that's what happened so yeah. uh that's yesterday still mad bad. but you know you how do you make up for it you send people to sites where uh they tell you what he should have said and what he should have done so at least you are informed because okay. this virus is not going away. As a matter of fact, yes. okay, here's Reuters today, Iran's death toll from coronavirus reaches 26. Health ministry, they have something like an 11% uh, death rate in Iran. That doesn't mean that that's the true number. You have to wonder how, first of all, how uh, honest they are about the numbers, and secondly, whether or not they have uh, testing capabilities. But testing is difficult. Not all states have it uh, right now in this country. Uh, and uh, the initial test uh, kit that CDC used didn't work as well as it should have. Mm. So these are all growing pains that you always have at the beginning of an outbreak. This happened, uh, 
you know, multiple times in multiple situations. It's par for the course. It's normal. It's not incompetence. You have to do a test. You have to do it quickly. And then you have to validate it. It turns out the Chinese are probably doing a pretty reasonable job with this, although they haven't published the validation statistics. So, you know, again, everything is with a grain of salt about the testing. But when you look at the death rates, well, how do you know? How do you know if there aren't, uh, you know, uh, minor cases that are so minor that you didn't even know they were there, therefore decreasing the death rate because you're increasing the denominator? And the answer is we don't know. And you got to make sure that your testing is accurate before you can even begin to guess at those statistics. But what we do know is that so far what's reported is that it's a serious but not out of control illness. Mm -hmm. Now, another thing he did at the press conference, and we talked about this the other day, too. So Sanjay Gupta, the doctor, says to him, so you keep saying that this is no worse than uh, seasonal flu, but seasonal flu has a 0.1% death rate, and this has 2%. And Trump contradicts Gupta and says, no, you're wrong. Seasonal oh, flu is much true. higher. Well, actually, oh, Gupta is right. Uh, yes, but uh, Trump had heard the number 69,000. Well, uh, but, you know, what he was doing so is he was infusing seasonal flu with pandemic flu. Oh. In the 1918 huge outbreak, uh, pandemic flu was 2%, maybe higher, maybe 5%. Uh, and that's what he was thinking. But uh, really? seasonal flu is quite low. So this is worse than seasonal flu, but not as bad as some of the other horrible things that are out there. Hmm. Uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, bird flu, again, 60%, Ebola, 70%. Uh, so, you know, he, he made the point. It's not Ebola. He said something like, if, if you get Ebola, you just disintegrate. Did he? Did right he know your that? eyes. Yeah. Okay. That's what he said. You know, oh, all right. like science fiction. Uh, <clears throat> you know. Well, he saw uh, the movie. What's that? He saw the movie. Yeah, something like that. I don't know. So, uh, but it, extremely guess. unhelpful. And if you were looking at for validation and, uh, and for reassurance, uh, as we say in New York, forget about it. Yeah, I think I'll practice my talking to myself and drooling so everybody stays away from me on the bus. <laughs> well, it was kind of a train wreck, that's for sure. And uh, yeah, I, 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 the other point, I like the, the parallel point here of the media not quite knowing whether we look, do we have a responsibility to help people find correct exactly. information? Do we uh, do we have a responsibility to distill this down? I mean, I think they still treat it like any other president where they would interview him and he might pause to think through his words or give a few ums and ums and ahs and they edit those out to make a more coherent statement. But that's because you know that the guy can make a coherent statement ordinarily, whereas this is just creating one out of whole cloth. Exactly, because uh, they felt like they had yeah. to. Now, here's another aspect of it, again, which should be our, reported, and that's from the National Journal. Mm -hmm. Coronavirus outbreak sparks drug supply chain concerns. The disease outbreak in China has increased worries about potential drug shortages, but experts say FDA has only a few options to address the problem. The market knows this. One of the reasons why it dropped. Ah. Yeah. Uh, another thing. And, uh, and by the way, pretty good proof that maybe just in time uh, delivery for if for anything, uh, pharmaceuticals, virologists, whatever, not necessarily all that well suited to pandemic situations right meanwhile i'm looking more. at the markets here and uh dow said to drop 450 points is worst week since the financial crisis continues oh, right uh so that was uh yesterday mm -hmm. uh february 26th today is february 27th the market is still going to drop i think more like a, a hundred points or so 300 points maybe uh let's see what it has what can guess? i find the futures futures uh, Dow, down 437 points okay. before the market opens in pre-market trading. So uh, I don't think that the market was reassured by what Trump said yesterday. Why am I focusing on the market? Isn't that the least important thing in the world? That's the political side of this. Everything Trump did yesterday was to prop up the markets because the only thing he cares about is himself and uh, uh, getting reelected. Mm -hmm. All that, right. That is, that's what the news reports should all add because that's a fact uh yes Not but they're afraid of opinion. being sued for reporting that fact which is yeah and then there'll be discovery happened. and then it'll look even more like a jerk so fine well, so, well but that's what's going we'll have to on wait here. for that yes uh that's true and he was asked about that even in the in the press conference which was a little annoying that they didn't well, i mean what's the point in focusing on the virus i guess when you're talking to the president but 
Uh, yeah, news yesterday that the Trump campaign is suing the New York Times, I think, or was it the Washington Post? No, New York Times. New York Times. Okay, suing or the New York Times. Article, which, you know, it's <clears throat> right. ridiculous and, and nobody th- – it's like a Devin Nunes uh, lawsuit. Nobody's going to take that seriously. Yes. Uh, all, it do, all it will do is bolster New York Times subscriptions. So, you know, good work, mm, Mr. Maybe. President. But uh, the whole idea that he's not focused – on public health is actually, I think, going to sink in. This is a Katrina moment, and I think it's going to sink in with the public regardless of how it's covered. All right. Because, you know, people so. start thinking about, okay, well, how does it affect me? And then you get this completely different message from CDC and your local public health folks yeah. who will take guidance from CDC, not the president. And, uh, you know, it's it's then the markets, and you look at it, and then you see Trump's reaction. And uh, this is not good for the country in terms of the virus, but it's also not good for the president in terms of politics. Oh, so he's well. very vulnerable. So that guy was wrong. It wasn't even... Uh, whoever that force. guy was, that guy was wrong. Yeah, the, the uh, analyst who said that uh, he had done such a great job with it politically. Oh, Steve Schmidt, yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, that appears to be wrong. Uh, yeah. All right. Meanwhile, yeah, I think uh, the latest uh, panicky sort of headlines are, let's see, uh, the, the, I guess they're closing schools in Japan... Like I, I don't know. I thought I saw that it said they were getting ready to close schools for a a month solid, and, uh, and then of course the uh, news that there's a, a a case unrelated to travel and with no uh, right. I mean, in other words, just when Trump was telling us everything yes. was out of control, like two minutes after that, there's <laughs> right. a case in Northern California that doesn't seem to have a point of origin. Hmm. Yes. That means that it was spread in the U.S. If confirmed. And uh, the docs at the hospital where he's at say, yeah, we can't figure out where he got it. That means he got it from the community. If he got it from the community, that means it's in the United States and it's the beginning of like, who else did he, who did he get it from? Who did that person get exposed to? A chalkboard moment. You know, yeah. and so that's where you start talking about that R naught thing and how many people does a single case infect over time? And the answer is a lot. Yeah. Well, uh, he was talking about infected countries as though we weren't one, but. Uh... Guess that's wrong. Be right back. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Or read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Welcome back now to the Kegro in the Morning Show here on Edwards Radio. Okay. Uh, all right. I've got, to, oh, I did, I did find uh, the, yes, they are going to be closing schools in Japan. Uh, and I'm sure Trump, maybe, I don't know. Uh, Trump hadn't heard about that as of last night, I don't think. But now that uh, I see in the headline here uh, that uh, Japan's uh, Abe is going to be shutting the schools nationwide to fight coronavirus, he'll be, you know, because he's a very strong leader and he plays golf and he's a lovely fellow and loves the chocolate cake just like uh, uh, Xi Jinping of uh, China. And he, the two of them are fantastic guests at Mar-a-Lago. So I guess we'll be closing schools soon too. And that's a good well, thing. Well, so and here's the problem with that. All be right. The U.S. is not uh, Japan. And the people not. react differently to these mm. sorts of things. We went through this extensively when looking at the 2009 pandemic. When I say we, we're talking about uh, HHS, DHS, and uh, CDC. And the problem with school closure is then what do you do with the kids and what do you do with the parents? What? I don't know what you mean. Everybody should Well, okay, you close the schools and the kids are home. So now what? Go to Mar-a-Lago. Go to the mall where they can all get right. sick. I mean, what do you do with them? And if the parents have to stay home with the kids, let's say the younger kids, let's say the preschool or, or uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, primary school age, then uh, the parents are missing a day of work. And if they're missing a day of work, Standing then around. it's a hardship for the family and at the same time, uh, bad for the economy. 
So chances are the parents will find some way not to miss work. So what do you do? You drop them all at a friend's house who will watch them all while you go to work. And it's basically the same thing as going to school. And so it's not terribly practical or, you know, the older kids just go to the mall. So it's it's not a practical thing in disease prevention because not only does it not prevent, but at the same time, you're hurting the economy, except not as bad as you think because people won't listen. I mean, at at every level, (laughs) it's a failure. So that's why generally schools aren't closed. Yes. Now, local, remember, all public health is local. So your school system may close and the next one in the next county, Uh, if that's the way you do it, may not. If it's a state run system, that is to say central, Mm. uh, then it can close. But if it's a home rule kind of situation where it's your local school board or superintendent that decides whether to close the school and not the state, then you have spotty results all over this state. And again, a mess. It's it's not simple. So maybe Japan can do it by fiat, but not so easy to do in the United States. Like caucuses, caucuses versus primaries. If the state yeah, closes the much. school, it's fine. If uh, if you have make up your own rules or you have to depend on how well trained the your, volunteers your are. Your trained volunteers do, may, maybe not so well. That's exactly right. Okay. And so, you know, that's a big part of this. And so don't think that just declaring that we do this. Why, you know, why can't we just have the same measures right. that China did and stop it the way China did? Well, we don't know that China stopped it because we only know what they report, and and that's yeah, not totally trustable. Uh, and uh, even authoritarian countries like Iran are having tremendous difficulty stopping this virus from spreading. And so we don't know that those things work. And even if they did, it doesn't mean you can implement them here. Hmm. Yes. Well, true. And even if you tried, it might come out differently depending on who runs what place and who listens to who. Right. Okay. So that's the situation, just so you know. And if you feel worse about it today than you did yesterday, it's because uh, Trump spoke. Hmm. Yes. All right. Well, I'm sure he fixed it. Probably it'll be better today. He should just come the airwaves. You know, and again, uh, you know, what does it mean? If he says there's only 10 cases, does that mean somebody at CDC is under political pressure to eliminate the other cases? To bring it down to what he said it was, because that's the way the rest of the government works, because yeah, you have this kid firing everybody who doesn't do that. Right. I guess. I mean, yeah, I don't know how, how seriously. At every level, take it. this is exposing Trump for who he is and what he's doing in a way that is forcing the media to actually look at it. OK. Uh, it's the only good thing that comes out of this. Yeah. If they learn a lesson, which, you know, they've shown. A, well, the public's going to take their lesson that. from it, regardless of what they oh. do. I mean, this is one of these things where you have no choice but to do it. And then the public sees what they see. You put them on TV. Everybody watches. And then you go, okay, my God. Yeah. Uh, Well, uh, I I suppose at least he'll think he's done the job and he won't put himself on TV again for that. Maybe. Uh, But, you know, we'll see. In Uh, any case, I'm not saying his numbers plunge. It's just that the numbers are already not good. This helps them not rise. And he's already got issues with re-election, although it'll still be close. We all know that. I mean, there's a uh, Muhlenberg poll out of uh, uh, Pennsylvania. That's where Muhlenberg is. Muhlenberg College, a very good. And they basically have an even uh, race between uh, Biden and Trump or or Bernie and Trump, the two leading uh, people. Warren and Trump are tied. Um, And so Pennsylvania is going to be a, a tough sell. Of course, there's other polls that show a much bigger lead in Pennsylvania. Uh, Wisconsin, we know, is going to be a tough sell. And so a lot of that's going on. But the the big news politically right now, of course, is South Carolina. Last night, CNN had a series of uh, uh, town halls uh, that they've been having. But last night was uh, Biden's turn. He did fantastic. Klobuchar's turn. She did okay. They're all better in this setting than they are with these stupid debate rules. And then Elizabeth Warren, who also was fantastic. Uh, Now, Biden's moment was speaking from the heart about what it meant to lose his son. And, you know, basically brings a tear to your Everybody who watched it said, I don't know if he's going to win. I don't know if he's got it in him to be president. But, you know, this guy's this guy's real. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you, you can't buy that, Mike Bloomberg. Oh, <laughs> you well. can't buy that uh, with that. That's the uh, earned uh, media sort of thing. Viral going around. Elizabeth Warren viral. actually uh uh, her moment had to do with uh, uh, stepping on a Bernie bro. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess he was one, right? 
Yeah, he stands up and says, I want to know how you could, you know, why don't you support democracy in so many words? Oh, I love democracy. Uh, because uh, you and everybody else, except for Bernie Sanders, said that, uh, uh, you know, you'll go with whatever the convention decides. And Bernie says that whoever has the most delegates, whether they have a majority or not, nice. should win. Why are you stepping on democracy? And Elizabeth Warren very calmly pointed out to the Bernie bro, who didn't know or professed to not know. And they turned his microphone off so he couldn't complain about it. Oh. That uh, look, That's what happened is that Bernie was took the opposite position four years ago, and the Bernie bro said no, he didn't. And Elizabeth Warren said, oh no, 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 he did. He took the opposite position four years ago, and then explained it to him. And at that point, they cut his microphone off so he couldn't keep protesting because obviously mm -hmm. he was there to make trouble. Uh, well, it was a great moment, and she handled it beautifully. Guns, yeah. All right. Well, I mean that that is true. It comes down to. That was the same. That that was the same position. Uh, it was, I mean, it, she wasn't upset. She yeah. wasn't uh, overreacting. She was very calm. She, as the teacher, she is. She simply mm. explained to the student, "You think you know everything on the first day of class? Let me explain to you what's really going on here." It was brilliant. Now, these things usually don't matter. Oh well. Uh, all right. Then. In Biden's case, it might because South Carolina is. Uh, in two days. Yes. And South Carolina is his lifeline. He has to win that. And if the polling is correct, uh, you know, he's going to win and he should do OK. If Bernie wins, Bernie's going to put the nomination away. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, okay. but the Clemson, uh, South Carolina poll out yesterday had Biden up by 18, which is an improvement. Oh. If Biden does that, he's right back in the race. Yeah. The East Carolina University poll from South Carolina had Biden up seven. That's enough to, to do the job. But uh, historically, like in New Hampshire, the uh, polls generally pick the winner and miss the margin. Mm. The margin's usually bigger than the polls. And that's because people make up their mind late. It's not because the polls are wrong. The polls were right yesterday, but wrong today. The polls were right yesterday, but the, the election is until tomorrow, you know, that kind of thing. So, okay. uh, you know, look to Biden to do fairly well if he does, changes the race a bit. Uh, his problem in catching Bernie is that Bernie still will have uh, much more money and such to spend a few days later on Super money. Tuesday. Ah. And California has already voted. Yes, you know? or much of so, it. Much of it. So so there's a lot going on that still puts Bernie in a strong position. But, mm. you know, it by Saturday evening, this could be a completely different race. Uh, all right. Good. I could use another one. Yeah. So so we'll see what happens. What we have. I'm not happy with. Right. Okay. In the generic ballot news, uh, YouGov still has the Democrats up by eight, despite the mess they made of their uh, nomination process. Mm. And Trump is still Trump and does stuff like he did yesterday. So all of that. Uh, I think is, uh, you know, room for hope. Whoever the Democratic nominee is uh, will have a chance against Trump if you don't do stupid things like, well, I don't know, hand Florida to him. Oh, yeah, right. Why is that happening? Uh, well, you know, yes. So they say. Okay. So they say. Well. Who says that? People in Florida. Uh, yes. Well, what do they know? What do they know? So, uh, you know, that's, that's my summary for today. Okay. You know? And, and uh, you know, there's got to be a little annoyance about it because, my God, Trump had an opportunity to speak to the nation and uh, he's not up to the job. And it's just so painfully obvious. Uh, yeah. I mean, it was really as clear as day. But as you don't have control over everything. When we saw the CNN town halls yesterday, it was pretty clear and uh, I'm not saying anything against Bernie. It wasn't his turn uh, yesterday. It was the other people's turn. Mm. But uh, it's pretty clear that Biden and Warren should be doing much better than they are. But it is what it is. Yes. Well, uh, yeah, it was it was pretty crazy watching him do that. By the way, I'm just sort of taking a look at that New York Times article that you shared with us up at the top. Trump has a problem with the coronavirus, right? His credibility. Um, mm -hmm. do you, what like, what is this photo that they use to illustrate it from. He's, uh, I guess, coming out at a rally, but the lighting in this thing is really weird. Plus, he's coming from behind a black curtain that's been opened up, you know, to, to part it and, and pulled aside, and there's this weird purplish under lighting to it. And it, it looks like he's coming out for a funeral. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, it's, uh, the whole thing is built like a coffin. Yeah. And it looks like, the, I guess, the stairway and pathway out to the stage, it looks like there's a maybe a casket in front of him. He's got his head bowed. There's an American flag hanging behind him. And I'm sure it was meant to look 
powerful and strong because yeah, it was, look, it was meant to look like a missile or a phallic symbol. I, oh, all right. Well, that I didn't. That, that I don't get out of it. But um, well, look at it now. Hmm. Oh, I see. The, you mean the flag itself? Or yes. The whole, yes. Okay. Yeah. The, yeah. The, the background. pathway. Yeah. But what I'm seeing makes it look like he's coming out for a state funeral of some kind, which is an amazing zone. thing to have. Yeah, chosen for a coronavirus thing. But th this isn't what it's the thing looked That's like yesterday. That's why they make them look so somber. I guess so. It was really crazy looking. I don't know. <clears throat> Random choice, I guess. But uh, I don't know. Maybe they thought it was symbolic in some way. I, I can't. Well, you know, from that article, for years, experts have warned that Mr. Trump has been squandering the credibility he could need in a moment in a national emergency like a terrorist there attack is. or a public health crisis. Mm -hmm. Now, as the coronavirus races across the globe and has begun to threaten the United States, Mr. Trump could face a moment of reckoning. Maintaining a calm and orderly response during an epidemic in which countless lives could be at stake requires the president be a reliable public messenger. Hmm. Uh, yeah. No. All right. Well, I say yeah. He blew you blew it as we review. I'm not going to review again. Uh, all right. Yeah, I mean, th that's true. That's an excellent point. That we've been warned all along that at some point he's going to need people to suspend their disbelief of him, and it can't be done uh, under these circumstances. That is to say three years in office plus an additional year of campaigning on complete nonsense, lies, a historical, a scientific uh, anti-facts. So, right. Now, again, 80 percent of confirmed cases are not severe. And that means you can have a lot of mild cases and that makes it tough to detect. It makes it tough to stop. Mm -hmm. But that means 20 percent of confirmed cases are severe. I guess. That's a lot. Oh, well, sure. I don't know. Is it? I guess so. So, you say so, so. when you're talking about, oh, well, don't, you know, and I got some of this blowback when I was talking about it on Daily Coast yesterday. Oh. This is the United States, right? We're number one. We can <laughs> do stuff. That. We can, as you pointed out, hold up a list and say that, look, on the list of great countries, we're at the top of the list. I just That's made right. it out of PowerPoint, but I'm just showing you. Um, our medical system would be overwhelmed. If 20% of confirmed cases of coronavirus at a large scale were mm -hmm. severe and needed hospitalization, we would not have the capacity. Yeah. We know this because we planned for flu pandemics. The hospitals would be building uh, mini hospitals with tents for the less sick people outside the hospital. Yeah. Don't make them look like this picture. Uh, we've done that. We've drilled that at the hospital. I mean, that's, yeah. a, that's a real thing that people tents. would do. And a yeah, lot of sure, the right? uh, don't worry, everybody would help out uh, kind of drills that local and state people do with minimal resources don't work in real time. Uh, again, uh, we talked about this years and years ago, but let me give you an example. During a flu pandemic drill, you might want uh, to practice handing out uh, medications, Tamiflu in the case of flu. And so your local public health people will practice setting up uh, medication stations. All right. Okay. Tables but they don't have enough people to do that. So how do they run this drill? The best way to run the drill so everybody gets a chance to practice is you get all the different communities to come to the one designated community that's the drill community, and you all practice there. And then you get to know each other. And so in a real emergency, you know who to call, and you get to trust each other. It's, it's a wonderful thing. But mm -hmm. uh, that means you're using the personnel from the next town and the next town over in order to do this. What happens if the... Uh, emergency hits all towns at the same time and you go to call your next town over let's uh help us out like you did in the drill and they say no no you come here and help us out uh, we, we need you here over well i'll call the other town no no we're busy we can't come over and help you we got our own issues here why don't you come over here and help us and and so you know the things that are planned for don't exactly work out the way you think they're going to in real life that's just one minor example but just everything yeah works that way everything i can see that like again Back to the uh, the caucus example. Look, the instructions are clear. How come things yep. are going wrong? Exactly. Just divide this number by that. Number. Oh, we didn't account for this might happen, and we right. don't really have a backup plan. Okay, and uh, yeah, now you report your results. Uh, put them in the app. Uh, the app's not working. Call me on the phone. Right. Phone's busy. Yeah. Oh, my God. So, you know, lots and lots and lots of stuff, uh, mm. you know, happens. Uh, and again, you know, sure, it's a wake-up call to increase our capacity and understand sure. where pandemics come from and do better planning. All of that's true. All of that's been true for decades. 
and uh, Republicans don't want to put money on it because they're businessmen, and they know that if you're doing something that doesn't happen in the next 15 minutes, it doesn't help you in the first quarter, then your stockholders will revolt and they'll vote for somebody else. And so it doesn't get done. And this short-sighted thinking is killing us, literally. And so, you know, that's part of the issue here. Uh, is it enough to make you a radical and vote for a Bernie Sanders over a moderate? Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Excellent. Let's do it. Uh, people are doing it. Secret That's why man. he's got a chance to win this year. Uh, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Reserve judgment. Hmm. Uh, yes. Uh, I would prefer judgment, I myself okay. to have people who know what's going on, who can plan for the future, who do this incrementally so that you're prepared this year, next year, and the year after instead of trying to build a fire station during the fire. Uh, mm. Now, who's the best person to do that? Well, you know, it's like talking about electability. The person who can get it done is the person I want. Well, who is that person? Well, let's have an argument about it. If we agreed, then we could agree on why we lost in 2016, and we would agree as to who the best candidate is, and none of that's true, and so we don't agree. Fine. That's what primaries are for, and frankly, that's what elections are for. But, you know, that's who I'm looking for. Mm. All right. Well, now we know. Now we know. Excellent. So, does, it, does it work? Are we set? AP NORC has a poll out this morning. Election what? security and integrity worry Americans. A poll from AP NORC finds skepticism about the democratic process in the United States. I wonder why that could be. Yes. While a third of Americans say they have high confidence in an accurate count, another third are only moderately confident, and a remaining third say they have little confidence. Hmm. That remaining third are either QAnon people or Regular folks who watch the Iowa caucuses. <laughs> Uh-oh. Yeah, well, because... You I threw that in there, that yeah. Okay, it's true. There, there are many reasons to come to the same conclusion. Uh, right. Who's to prevent Vlad Putin from interfering in the election? I don't know, said Reed Gibson, an independent voter in Missouri, referring to the Russian president. A U.S. Yes. intelligence agency said it interfered in the 2016 election with a sophisticated operation in a so division and help elect Donald Trump, a Republican... And they're still engaged, says Chris Ray from the FBI. So is Mitch McConnell and everybody else doing something to reassure us? Of course not. No. They'll take the help if it helps them win. Screw them. Uh Get out and vote. Don't give me this third party crap. Bernie may not be my first choice. I don't care. If he's the nominee, I'm voting for him. Uh Big time. Bigly. Bigly. Okay. Excellent. Well, at least you know what you're doing if yeah, exactly. uh, it comes to that. So that's my rant for today. Okay. Thanks for letting me get it out of my system. I'd rather talk to you and yell at you than yell at Chris Matthews. Really? Yeah, you're at least educable. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, sure, that's what they claim. Matthews uh, never learns. Yeah, although it would be satisfying some, uh, in some ways to yell at him. I suppose if you could turn his nah. microphone off, you could yell nah, at him. It's not no? satisfying. Really? I'd rather right. yell at Chuck Todd. Okay, then. All right, so I but I how how do I rate versus Chuck Todd in terms of much yelling? much better still better okay excellent I'm number one on this list by the way I'm holding it up here me Sweden Chuck Todd yeah all right at least he had a list Some so uh, what do you want to talk about that's what uh, I want to look I don't know uh, <laughs> I've got uh, well there's a, a number of uh, fun things what do you to want talk to talk about, about with me. Uh, well, I could tell you about. Did you know that uh, spe- we had mentioned uh, Devin Nunes and his stupid lawsuits yeah. earlier? Because Trump is now filing one of those stupid lawsuits. Uh, but uh, there's finally an ethics complaint filed uh, in on Capitol Hill against him and uh, wondering who's paying for all of his stupid lawsuits. I guess that's not oh the federalist question. Uh, <laughs> I guess so. Maybe who's that's paying the for the answer. federalist? I don't know. Nobody knows. Yeah. Probably I mean, Putin. With Trump, there's the imaginary billions of dollars, uh, although it's actually the Trump campaign that's filing the suit against the New York Times, not Trump himself. That's the difference. But yeah, someone has filed an ethics complaint saying uh, he's filing uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of lawyers' times being used and filing all these lawsuits. Who's paying? And uh, I guess we'll have an inquiry about that at some point. And uh, in the House, uh, well, of course, the Ethics Committee is evenly divided. So we'll see whether they end in stalemate or whether they push the investigation forward. Uh, They're divided. Half the committee thinks that Nunes is an idiot and the other half thinks he's a crook. Yes, that's right. Uh, And that's true. He's not all all that widely respected on his own side of the aisle either. Yeah, that's uh, the Republican side. They think he's an idiot, whereas the Democratic side thinks he's a crook. That could be it. 
Hey, you should look up uh, who serves on the House Ethics Committee because sometimes uh, the Ethics Committee is kind of a, a dead zone. People don't really like getting assigned to it, and so it sometimes uh, goes to the people who draw the short straw. And even though Nunes is popular among the the radically stupid people that run the House Republican Conference. Uh, it is the people who sometimes say things like, wow, this is really stupid and we look like idiots. Oh, yeah, if you're not on board, we'll we'll put you on the ethics committee, which is an enormously stupid play for the very stupid people who run the conference because they end up uh, in front of them at some point And it's uh, people that they've disrespected and and shunted aside getting a chance to strike back for once. So. Kind of so uh, let me leave you with two thoughts. Okay. One is from Harry Enten, uh, the prognosticator. Used to be at 538. Now he's on CNN. Yeah. And uh, he's adopted my mantra. Ah. My mantra, of course, is uh, nobody knows nothing. TM, TM. Uh, every time I think I have this primary figured out, I realize I don't, says Harry. And that's yeah. because of what might happen in South Carolina. Uh, and then, uh, of course, the uh, excellent uh, Biden uh, and uh, Warren uh, uh town halls from yesterday and then uh kyle cheney writes uh, the house has filed a hundred and page brief with the supreme court arguing in favor of its subpoenas for access to trump's personal financial records decision by end of june oh okay well that is pretty interesting yeah. uh we'll see you know well uh it could get ignored obviously but it will, we'll as david corn would say this would be a good day for trump to release his tax returns yes not a not Saying a bad it, one at all. He says says it every day for three years. He should put coronavirus all over them and then release them. Uh, no, then he wouldn't touch them. Well, and he, then and then he'd be accused of releasing the coronavirus. The funny thing is, ah, Trump is a uniquely well placed person to push hand washing. True. Not only did. is he president, he's a germaphobe. Yes. Uh, he so did in make a reference. perfect world, he'd be the perfect messenger to tell people to wash their hands, which is the single best thing that you can do. Yeah. And, and keep your finger out of your friend's nose. I mean, those oh, two things. Uh, the CDC actually has published a guide to facial hair for men. Oh, yes. Mustaches <laughs> and uh, beards. Mutton chops be and beards have to go because you can't wear a mask properly with that. But that the old uh, Hitler mustache works. Oh, okay. Well, that's what Also known as a toothbrush. And the funniest away. thing about it is that they named all the mustaches. Oh? Yeah. They, they have titles for all of them. Really? Are there yeah. some that you, you... I'll find that graphic for you and send them. It's, right. it's actually hilarious. Okay. Uh, yeah. So are, are they saying that some are acceptable because they're easier to fit under the mask? Is that all? Yes. Okay. When well, you um, are getting fitted for personal protective equipment, PPE, I, I am always getting you have mask. to put a mask on. And some of these masks are actually uh, much uh, larger uh, fitting masks than the typical uh, surgical mask you see on TV. Worn improperly with the mask below your nose when, in fact, it's supposed to cover your nose. Uh, and so uh, then you put a little uh, round, clear plastic uh, cylinder over your head while you're wearing the mask. You do it like a, like a dog that's had an operation? Something like that. But, but it's completely encased. Oh. So it's a round cylinder that you could see through cylinder, yes. that spits over your head like a top hat that's pulled all the way down to your shoulders. Okay. <laughs> and then what you do right. is the person helping you to do this uh, sticks a uh, – uh, remember we talked about the old Bunny, Bugs Bunny cartoon where you, where you uh, put alum in, the, in your mouth with oh, one yes. of those little sprayers? Right. So you put one of those little sprayers with a, a sweet-tasting sugar solution into yeah. the uh, cone, into that uh, cylinder. Yeah, and then you run around and, you get and you spray it, and then you, the person wearing the mask, inhales and sees if you can taste it. Ah. And if you can taste it, okay. the mask failed. I see. So oh. that's how you test whether your personal protective equipment fits. So okay. you put, if you have a beard going. or a mustache and you want to know whether it's okay, you actually have to go through this process. And that tells you whether or not you got to shave. Okay. That's interesting. Right. Huh. And I promise you, that's not what's going to happen with real people out no. there. No. Right. And uh, that's why they're talking about what do you do? Yeah. No one's going to go through that process. Uh, maybe we could 
increase the eyes. Maybe we should use like taco tasting spray. Right. So I like found the graphic way. and I'm going to send it to you now just okay. so you can have a good laugh. I see. And there it is. Ah, yes. Oh, yeah. And uh, Kate Cheryl had just sent it, uh, sent okay. it on as yeah. well. Yeah. So clean shaven, stubble, long stubble, full beard, French fork. You can have French the French fork, fork, which looks like a Diablo, right? The duck tail. Uh, what is the uh, difference between some of these things? Can the ducktail. This is the top row I'm looking at. And these are all not acceptable. Uh, and the ducktail, uh, you know, is, is uh, just a, instead of the French fork, your beard comes to two points, but the ducktail comes to one point, right? You can have the Verdi or the Garibaldi. You can. Uh, or you, you can have, uh, and those are not acceptable. What you could do is a soul points. patch. That works. Oh, okay. Great. That's okay. Just or a goatee. Uh, but careful. Chin hair may eventually cross the seal. Uh, a chin curtain like the old Abraham Lincoln doesn't work. Chin curtain. <laughs> right? I mean, the names of this are fantastic. The horseshoe doesn't work, but you could do side whiskers. That's okay. Uh, Mutton chops are out. Uh, okay. They have something called the hulahi, which looks like the uh, caveman in those commercials. That doesn't work. <laughs> All right. All right. But the toothbrush, bottom row, uh, is the old uh, uh, Hitler mustache, and that works just fine. Yeah. All right. Or, oh, or we I could do with Zorro. That's Zorro's are great. Zorro. Yeah. <laughs> or you could do the handlebar mustache, which they label as the villain. The villain. And it's, uh, oh, well, it just it Right? Depends. For Manchu doesn't work. I see. A okay. dolly doesn't work because it's too long, so I'll dolly. Hmm. But a pencil mustache. Wow. Uh, or an old Groucho Marx draw it in with, uh, you know, sort of black. Uh, uh, Sharpie. You should uh, Sharpie. Sharpie. That works fine. Okay. So, you know, just so you know. So you the have to Zappa think about it. Zappa is okay. Yeah, well. the Zappa. The Zappa is an interesting <laughs> one. Walrus, that's on it. Walrus works. That's a, so John Bolton's okay. Yeah. Oh, dang. All right. Well, that's all. It's it's very weird. And it's very weird looking because they have the outline of the mask uh, drawn in there, too. And I couldn't tell what was going on. I'm like, these are chimpanzees with facial hair is what it looks like to me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that Wow. Uh, that's very interesting. I really, I can't believe they had to come up with names for those things. But, yeah. Uh, so if you want to look at a picture on radio, just uh, talk to David and I. We'll bring you something that you can't see that we are minutes. laughing over for 10 minutes. <laughs> all right. Down to 10. Thanks, Greg. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. We'll talk to you on Monday when everyone will have the coronavirus. Welcome back now to the Kegro in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Man, there's an awful lot uh, in this this fabulous chart here, and I guess uh, we're finding a shareable version of it so we can put it in the in the roundup and or tweet it around. But um, man, well, the, uh, you know what? Here's a tweetable version of it. Uh, we can retweet Kate Sherrill's thing, so those of you listening live can take a look at this. This is really ridiculous, and, and it's a CDC chart. Did they generate it? I mean, Trump was saying that they uh, stand around doing nothing, getting paid, but in reality, they were coming up with the names or researching the names, I guess, if they really existed, of all of these different sorts of facial hair, which really, honestly... I don't know. I mean, this is eye-catching, and it gets people to talk about it. So I suppose that's the uh, the greatest value in this. But, you know, uh, there's a very small differences between some of these things. And, and for instance, uh, mutton chops. I thought I kind of knew what mutton chops were. And as it turns out, I think the thing I'm thinking of when I think mutton chops is, in fact... What they have labeled, what is it? Hulahi? Is that right? It's hard to read the print on this screen here, but H U L I H E E. And I don't know what that is. That named after a person who had that? <clears throat> I'm not really sure, but I would have said uh, that guy has mutton chops. What I didn't realize was that no, the guy to his uh, to his right has mutton chops. But it's uh, hmm, one to the left on our chart because we're looking at the chart. Uh, Zappa, that's clearly named after Frank Zappa. <clears throat> and I don't know that, uh, but yeah, some of these things, it's difficult to even see whether or not there's really a, a serious difference. And the whole point is, look, if you have facial hair and you get one of those masks and you put the mask on and facial hair is sticking out from the mask somewhere, anywhere, really, 
uh, then the answer is no, that that facial hair is too big and it's not going to work with this mask because it's going to, the facial hair is going to stick out and prop up the mask and germs can get in under the side and that's it. But they decided to go this route instead. And then somebody had to come up with a name on all these things. Well, I have, you know, well, how many they got here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine across and one, two, three, four down. So what is that? 36 different styles of facial hair that they had to come up with and pretend that they were all distinct and that uh, they each had to have a name. And, you know, somewhere along the line, they were like, well, I've got names for uh, 29 of them. I'm seven short. Can you help me out? What's the, what would be the name for this thing that is like mutton chops, but not mutton chops? I don't know. And uh, how long does it take them to come up with something like that? Or maybe the answer is, uh, I don't know. What the hell should we call it, Mr. Hullahy? And he says, hell if I know. I don't have that kind of facial hair, uh, but we'll call it the Hullahy anyway. I want to, is, uh, all right, time out. We'll go to the to Google. and uh, Hullahy, is that right? Hullahy, and it says Hullahy Beard is the first one that comes up. Uh, here's the autocomplete from Google. Maybe this will give us some clues. Hullahy beard, Hullahy, which thanks for auto-completing that. I've already typed the whole thing in. That's really a great algorithm. Hullahy palace, Hullahy palace wedding, Hullahy facial hair, and Hullahy palace concerts. I am curious about almost all of those things. If I just hit return there, on Hawaii, let's see, I got, oh, there's a place in Hawaii. Is it Hawaiian? Does it have nothing to do with anything? I don't know. Uh, all right, all right, I'm going to go back. Let's see, the Hawaii, dang, got to do it all over again. This is really something. No other radio show would dare. All right, Hawaii beard. There's some pictures, and one of them is borrowed from the chart. The Hawaii is the imperial family's closest relation to the original Burnside or Franz Joseph styles. Unlike its relatives, its name derives from the Hawaiian palace of the same name rather than the 19th century aristocrat. I am boggled by this. All right. This is, <clears throat> what is this in? Bespokeunit.com. What are imperial beards and friendly mutton chops? I don't know. Uh, let's see. So, <clears throat> again, the name is, unlike its relatives, the name derives from the Hawaiian palace of the same name rather than a 19th century aristocrat. So why? was they Were they vacationing in Hawaii? I don't really even understand. All right. This is a huge mystery and requires some investigation, but this can't possibly be the best use of our time. Ah, now here's some, here's an example in this article, though, of somebody whose facial hair is not going to work out with the uh, with the face mask. Is this, do they even identify, is that Kurt Russell wearing this ridiculous version of this beard? I, well, all right. Uh, and, then, and then there's friendly mutton chops. And are we talking about, is that, is that the guy from Motorhead? Holy mackerel. What a set of photos they have in this uh this is clearly a a website not to be taken seriously here's the holly though down at the end <clears throat> there's and they have like 50 ah this is a hipster facial hair kind of a uh, of a thing so no wonder they're using the weirdo pictures but um and, and the, really the weirdo face hair on the way down here there's, there's the a la Sov, Sovrov, Sovrov? Wow, a la Swovarov imperial beard, which basically looks like a giant handlebar mustache that runs uh, connected to the face, not set, not pulled out from the face and grown from under the nose, but all the way to the ears. Like, uh, I don't even know, like as if you have both a combination um, uh, iPod earbuds and mustache on your face. The Holahi imperial beard down here is let's see now we're gonna does it tell us why it's named for a hawaiian palace no uh but 
That's the part I really want to find out more about. But I, again, if I waste any more time on this, we're all going to go crazy. Um, yeah. And uh, Mike Musson here commenting, uh, by the way. Oh, yeah. And there's Greg is pointing at the bespoke unit uh, uh, article we're looking at, too. This is nuts. <laughs> Mike Musson saying, I guess the Burns guy originated the name for sideburns. That's true. And that makes sense. And that's why I figured... You know, like the Zappa, you know, it's named for Frank Zappa. And now I'm I'm just baffled by the Hullahee. Where did we get that from? There must be a Mr. Hullahee. No, it's a palace in Hawaii. So why did you choose that? I don't know. We needed 36 names. Uh, and we didn't even make them up. This, maybe they used bespokeunit.com. To come up. Where did they come up with the names? We don't know. It's a process. We've got to trace the provenance of these things all the way back to make sure that they make sense. We don't want people uh, putting on masks and risk. Uh... <laughs> Is that right? Greg says the soul patch named for Ger Gerald Soul. Is that? I don't even know if that's true. What does that mean? Who's that? Do I know him? Uh... Is, is this from one of your Marx Brothers movies again? This is crazy. I don't know. All right, we got to get off this subject. But honestly, uh, hipsters in their beards. No. So no what? Serious no? <laughs> Maybe there is a guy named Gerald Soul. I don't know. And now, yes, this is worse. Okay. And now, finally, maybe. All right, let's get off of the beards thing. Look, shave if you're worried about it. That's all I can tell you about it. And, uh, you know... The death to ZZ Top, apparently, is, is except the one guy who doesn't have a beard whose name is Beard. So you tell me, that's it. who's who's it all named after? <sighs> right. Uh, if you don't know what you're doing, then uh, be careful with the beards. And if you don't know where the name of your beard came from, you're probably going to die. I guess is that's the lesson I'm taking away from it. Now there are many other stories out there. Some of them which have nothing to do with coronavirus, as far as I know. And um, why don't I grab onto a couple? One, one that was sort of interesting, coming from across the pond, as it were. Oh, hmm. Did they remove their story? I don't know. The Scotsman.com had a story, and I still have it in... in uh, um, in pocket, but maybe I should look for it. Maybe they updated it or did they delete it? Cause it was a somewhat controversial thing. The headline was Scottish ministers urged to seek, uh, a quote, unexplained wealth order targeting Donald Trump's resorts. And I didn't keep the tweet that it came from, but now I'm thinking perhaps, we ought to search around for it because when I clicked on the article in Pocket and then said go to the original, uh, it can't find it. So now I, I want to find out, did they, I mean, maybe I should just go to the scotsman.com and see if there's something up on their front page about it. It was a fairly big deal is what it looked like. Do they have, there we are. So let me click on their... Uh, and they just parked it elsewhere. Now it says Scots ministers told to seek unexplained wealth order for Donald Trump resorts. Um, and I guess in our English version of it, it said Scottish ministers, uh, our American English version. Um, I guess I should read what they actually do have up on their website that would, uh, if I'm going to attribute it to them. Martin, uh, Martin McLaughlin is the author of this piece. The Scottish government has been urged to apply for an unexplained wealth order. I am not familiar with those, but I assume it's, uh, you know, something that you can do under British law that, uh, when someone is sitting on a giant pile of money that you can't explain, uh, the government has an interest in finding out exactly where it came from. I don't know if we have anything equivalent here without indicting someone first. Uh, I think you're allowed to walk around with unexplained wealth and not just be indicted purely for that in the United States. But, uh, well, we have a different system. All right. So they've been urged to apply for an unexplained wealth order to investigate Donald Trump's deals to acquire his Scottish properties. Uh, and let's see, just this versus 
the version I have in pocket. Is it considerably different? Hmm. No, not really. It doesn't look that way from the start. Patrick Harvey, MSP, I guess member of Scottish Parliament, co-leader of the Scottish Greens, said there were reasonable grounds for suspecting that the U.S. president or people he is connected with have been involved in serious crime. So that's a pretty significant thing to say. And of course, there is plenty of evidence of that. And I believe he's been involved in serious crime. And I guess they do in, or at least in the Scottish Green Party anyway, as well. He's called on ministers to apply to the court of session to seek answers as to how Mr. Trump bankrolled, uh, I guess uh, the the uh, contraction there being, how Mr. Trump has bankrolled his multi-million Acquisitions of land. They had some stilted uh, syntax here, but I guess multi-million pound, multi-million dollar acquisitions of land and property in his mother's homeland, they point out. Responding at First Minister's questions, Nicola Sturgeon stressed she was no defender of Mr. Trump, but said any allegations of criminality were a matter for Police Scotland and the Crown Office, I guess trying to duck responsibility for taking out an unexplained wealth order, a uh, uh, shortened here as UWO, and these things are relatively new, uh, it says, and rarely used power, which has been designed to target suspected corrupt foreign officials who have potentially laundered stolen money through the UK. Oh, okay. So a relatively new development. <clears throat> Not some old and ancient tradition or anything like that. But uh, I guess this would be an outgrowth of the effort we read about when we were trying to decipher what was going on with Burisma and what was really at the root <clears throat> of all the accusations of corruption from Burisma. We read that story about how the UK had... Uh, uh, dedicated itself, or at least tried to dedicate its uh, resources to trying to ferret out money that had been stolen by foreign officials and laundered through the UK, and that they were going to try and take this new responsibility seriously, because London apparently is a big hub for this, and, uh, you know, we, a transparent society ought not uh, to tolerate this. All right, so let's see. This mechanism, introduced in 2018, is an attempt to force the owners of assets to disclose their wealth. I'd like him to do that. If a suspected corrupt foreign official or their family cannot show a legitimate source for their riches, then authorities can apply to a court to seize the property. Ooh, this is excellent. Mr. Trump and the Trump Organization have always stressed that they did not require any outside financing for their Scottish resorts. George Soriel, the Trump Organization's former chief compliance counsel, told the Scotsman in 2008 that it had one billion pounds, quote, sitting in the bank and ready to go for its inaugural Scottish course located in Aberdeenshire. How do they say that? Aberdeenshire? It's not Aberdeenshire, I'm sure, but Aberdeenshire? Uh, what do they say in Scotland or elsewhere? Aberdeenshire. Anyway, uh, too many syllables to make that work properly for me. Scotland on Sunday. Uh, that is a publication, I assume, or a television show. I don't know. Scotland, but it's a hell size. Scotland on Sunday later revealed how the same year, Mr. Trump asked the Bank of Scotland. You should ask a different bank if you want to make this work. Uh, he tells Scotland... Uh, tells the Scotsman, we've got the money ready to go. It's sitting in the bank. Then he asks the Bank of Scotland for a 15-year mortgage worth £23 million and a £15 million construction loan as part of his efforts to establish a, quote, landmark hotel at St. Andrews in Fife, the home of golf. The bank refused and Mr. Trump's plans were never realized. Mr. Harvey an avowed critic of Mr. Trump and his administration, said that an UWO was designed precisely for these kinds of situations. And they really are, except they were sort of thinking more along the lines of Eastern European oligarchs with whom they're 
not aligned and there would be no question of uh, uh, endangering the special relationship with the United States. But as it turns out, um, we have an Eastern, style, Eastern European style government here now in the United States as well. And so he's actually quite right. He just won't find any conservatives who agree with him, I think. He told the MSPs, Trump's known sources of income do not explain where the money came from in these huge cash transactions. There are reasonable grounds for suspecting that his lawfully obtained income was insufficient. Trump is a politically exposed person in terms of the law, and there are reasonable grounds for suspecting that he or people he is connected with have been involved in serious crime. Some of them have pleaded guilty. He added, we need to be given confidence that the government will show leadership and use the powers available to it. And of course, I should uh, reiterate here, he's the leader or a member of the Scottish Greens, and I don't believe that they are sitting in power in the Scottish Parliament. So this is something that he's doing to, he's prevailing on a party, presumably somewhere to his right, because probably most people are to the right of the Greens almost everywhere, um, and, and attempting to, uh, well, it's interesting. I mean, it, it would be both shaming them into taking such an action and uh, probably, there's probably nothing about the call for a UW, an UWO here with which even uh, right-leaning politicians in Scotland would totally disagree. So it's an excellent wedge issue. And probably has some traction, um, but the, I would imagine that the majority party, whoever it is, I'm not even aware of who's the majority party in the Scottish Parliament, um, I'm sure that they are resistant to the idea of being tied to uh, a U and UWO being issued for the President of the United States and his associates. That would probably be pretty uncomfortable. Let's see. You know, it's not the first time there have been calls for NUWO in connection to Mr. Trump's Scottish interests. Uh, Av Avaz, Avaz, uh, how do they pronounce it? A-V-A-A-Z. It's a name uh, we've seen before. The nonprofit global activism organization has urged Scottish ministers to apply for such an order. Having taken what it described as expert advice on financial crime from advocate Brian Heaney, Avaz sent a briefing to Ms. Sturgeon's office last April. The issue of the Avaz or Avaz briefing was raised by Mr. Harvey today, and Ms. Sturgeon said she would be happy to revisit the correspondence and inform Mr. Harvey about what, if any, action had been taken. She emphasized the sensitivity involved in any potential legal action involving the government and, of course, the United States, I would say, and said issues about alleged criminality were a member for police and prosecutors. Ah, that's true, right? It would be an outrage to uh, to direct the police and investigators and prosecutors to undertake an investigation of Trump from the political arms. At least it would be would have been in the past here in the United States. Maybe not so much in Scotland. I don't know. In its 2019 briefing. Avaz set out what it described as enough reasonable suspicion as to the nature of Mr. Trump's cash payments for the Turnberry Golf Resort to justify Scottish ministers application for a this time a UWO to investigate the matter. How odd. Uh, all right. It went on. It is Mr. Trump's own actions that prompt legitimate questions about his income, which, if left unanswered, would call into doubt the Scottish government's determination to confront the specter of money laundering. Mr. Trump acquired the historic Turnberry Resort, a four-time host of golf's Open Championship, that would be what we would call the British Open, from Dubai-based Leisure Corp. in April of 2014 for £35 million. It has yet to turn a profit under his ownership, and the most recent accounts filed with Companies House show it is reliant on loans of £114.9 million to its parent undertaking, the Donald J. Trump Revocable Trust, 
a New York-based state grantor trust. Now, the Donald J. Trump Revocable Trust, I think, is that the the supposedly blind trust that the his sons are running while he's in office, quote unquote. Uh, what am I quote unquoting? In office or sons are running? Maybe both. There have been questions surrounding the finances underpinning Mr. Trump's acquisition of land and property in Scotland for years. In November of 2017, Glenn Simpson, the co-founder of Fusion GPS, <laughs> I figured they'd make an appearance here, actually a bit of a surprise, told the U.S. Congress he found Mr. Trump's golf courses in Scotland and Ireland to be concerning. Huh. Addressing the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence at the House of Representatives, Mr. Simpson said the accounts filed with UK authorities did not show any Russian involvement, but they did reveal enormous amounts of capital flowing into these projects from unknown sources. He added, if you're familiar with Donald Trump's finances and the litigation over whether he's really a billionaire, you know, there's good reason to believe he doesn't have enough money to do this and that he would have had to have outside financial support for these things. The Criminal Finances Act sets out a series of requirements which must be met before an UWO can be granted. They include satisfying the court that a respondent's lawfully obtained income would have been insufficient for the purposes of enabling the respondent to obtain the property, that the respondent is a politically exposed person, or that there are reasonable grounds for suspecting that they or a person connected with them have been involved in serious crime. The Trump Organization has been contacted for comment, but I guess has not gotten back to the Scotsman just yet. Okay. All very interesting. Uh, all very true. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how that would work its way through the court systems, even if it was issued in Scotland and whether or not their um, uh, inability to get a hold of his... American tax returns would damage their ability to establish that he doesn't have the income he would need in order to uh, to be able to to buy the golf course out right now. I'm getting a lot of uh, Twitter activity now. I think. Eh, uh, which I guess addresses some of this. Is this coming from, it looks like it's coming from the same article. Yeah, and I had tweeted the article around and I guess uh, they're running down this, this question of whether or not they'd be able to get a hold of his tax returns in order to prove that or whether that would be necessary in order to prove the case in Scotland. Good question. Certainly no expert or even a novice in Scottish law. So uh, I don't think... Uh, I don't think I'm getting anywhere with that one. All right, let's see. Let's put that article away. And uh, we got our break coming up here. Uh, not much room on this side of it <clears throat> to get through anything uh, particularly lengthy. But uh, let me add this thing. I think we can just squeeze this in. Uh, I mentioned the other day, um, and, and we've had uh, mentioned in today's show about the personnel issues in the Trump administration and particularly the uh, college kid still in college that they've hired to help screen uh, federal job applicants for anti-Trump bias, I guess. But we were also talking the other day about the kick that Trump is on rehiring people who had left the administration or been fired from the administration, either under a cloud or in disgrace or God knows what. Um, and Trump being, I guess, emboldened to rehire them, uh, which also manifested itself in a willingness to consider re-nominating people who had been nominated for positions in the federal government before but ended up withdrawing as unconfirmable for various reasons that uh, Trump is thinking about renominating. And we have another case of it here. CNN reporting the other day that Trump is again considering Texas Congressman, uh, what's his name, John Ratcliffe, as a permanent DNI uh, to, I guess, replace Grinnell, who's there in the acting capacity. But uh, he's 
uh, uh, Ratcliffe was nominated or his name was floated for the nomination uh, briefly at some point, what, last year or the the year before, but he ended up being uh, withdrawn because there were some serious accusations that he had inflated his resume with respect to his uh, 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 counterintelligence, I guess, and and anti-terrorism work at some point but i guess uh trump figures he can have whoever he wants now and he'll go back and uh, nominate people that were essentially you know preliminarily rejected by the senate last time and force them through this time hi it's me david waldman your host for kgrow in the morning and i've learned that i either need to update these announcements more often or stop saying that the announcements are brand new What's not new is that this message, too, is a call for your support in keeping the KGRO in the Morning Show on the air. My thanks go out to all of you who do support the show through your donations. The stats say that KGRO in the Morning fans download our program about 2,000 times each weekday. But our donors make up only about 8% of our daily listeners. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it simple to make easy, secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. If we're helping keep you sane during the Trump era, consider what that's worth. A dollar a day? Fifty cents. One thin dime. We do about 20 shows a month, so pick a number, do the math, and head to Patreon.com slash KGROX to let us know. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. Welcome back now to the Cake Order Morning Show here on Edwards Radio. All right, let's see. How do we proceed on, uh, once again, a million things that we should be getting to, and instead we spent all that time on the different kinds of beards because we're distractible that way. But uh, I left off just mentioning the CNN article. Let me just uh, read a little bit in here to make sure we got the story right here. Trump, uh, it says here, is revisiting the idea of nominating Texas Representative John Ratcliffe to be the next director of national intelligence, two sources told CNN. Ratcliffe withdrew his name from consideration for the same job last year amid bipartisan concerns about his qualifications. But the president now appears open to the idea of tapping him for the DNI job a second time. Trump has spoken with Ratcliffe and another candidate, uh, U.S. Ambassador to the Netherlands, Pete Hoekstra, about the DNI job in recent days. Or what do they say? Hoekstra? Is that right? Uh, Multiple sources have said these have been preliminary discussions and Trump could speak with additional potential nominees in the coming days. During these initial conversations, however, Trump has attempted to assess how loyal potential nominees would be to him Should they be nominated and confirmed for the job, two sources said. Trump is looking for a pick who would back his mandate, explained one of the sources. See, that's the way they're getting out of the actual language that he probably used that they just hinted at here and which really should have ground the whole thing to a stop. Uh, Trump, I mean, there was a time in the Trump presidency when everybody was shocked by the blatant demand for loyalty that he was making from what should be nonpartisan federal uh, officials. Uh, And when he demanded it of of, uh, then FBI Director James Comey, everyone thought it was a major scandal. But now I guess we're, uh, you know, we've built up an immunity to it and we don't even notice this anymore. But, uh, you know, and of course, then when people were making a stink about it, he denied that he demanded loyalty from Comey and Comey was pretty clear about the fact that he did. And then it was a he said, you know, well, he said, he said story for a long time, but it's still sort of uh, I mean, it made the made the radar screen as an outrage. Now it's just there. <clears throat> of course, he's demanding loyalty from people. And by the way, that just goes to prove Comey was probably telling the truth about that because there are other people that he's since demanded loyalty from, but we don't care anymore because it's, I don't know, lower on the rung of the ladders of, uh, lower rung on the ladder of, of the crimes of Donald Trump, I guess. Anyway, that's the story. And he's back to considering Ratcliffe because who the hell cares at this point? And, uh, I can have anybody I want. And Ratcliffe was, uh, was I don't know whether he thought he was still auditioning for the job, but he was uh, during the impeachment process. 
uh, like many Republicans in the House, an outspoken defender of the president, even when it was completely ridiculous to be doing so. And so I guess uh, the reward is that maybe I'll push you through for this job anyway, which is amazing because the big reward is now we'll have a public airing of this extraordinarily embarrassing thing that caused you to withdraw last time. Are you sure you want to do this? Because this really isn't a reward. It's it's bad. You don't want this. And guys have, I guess, uh, not been able to realize this because they're under the sway of the Trump cult. And, uh, you know, what can you do? It's pretty horrible. All right. Here's a couple other stories of some interest. Speaking of the intelligence, the DNI job, um, this was an interesting twist that we didn't get to mention from last week. Uh, Natasha Bertrand writing at Politico, Assange fight draws in Trump's new intel chief. It's not enough that we found out that he was working off the radar, that is to say unregistered as a foreign agent working for a Moldovan oligarch, which I didn't even realize uh, that we were concerned about Moldovan oligarchs, but I guess we were at some point in the past. Anyway, uh, now he's got this problem. Assange fight draws in Trump's new intel chief. Lawyers for the WikiLeaks founder, Assange, plan to use newly obtained recordings and screenshots to argue that Assange's prosecution is political in nature. And I guess here's the claim. Attorneys for Julian Assange, who's fighting a U.S. extradition request on espionage and computer hacking charges, plan to introduce evidence in the WikiLeaks founders extradition hearing involving President Donald Trump's new intel chief, Richard Grinnell. Gareth Pierce, a lawyer representing Assange in his extradition proceedings in London, plans to argue this week that the process to try to extradite her client. Ah, Gareth Pierce is a her, I see. Uh, The process to try to extradite her client was abused from early on. Representatives for Assange's defense team say they expect to introduce recordings and screenshots of communications of a close Grinnell associate, including a secondhand claim that Grinnell was acting on the president's orders. And who else's orders would he really be acting on, right? Grinnell's sudden embroilment in Assange's extradition fight comes at an inconvenient time as Democrats and national security veterans criticize him as ill-suited and unqualified to be the acting director of national intelligence, and it threatens to spotlight his close relationship with President Trump, feeding the widespread perception that the president is politicizing intelligence work for partisan ends. At the heart of the Assange team's argument is an ABC News report from last April alleging that while serving as Trump's ambassador to Germany, Grinnell told Assange's Ecuadorian hosts that the U.S. government would not pursue the death penalty for Assange. Is that on the table? Was, I guess. If Ecuador allowed British officials to enter its embassy in London and arrest him. Assange's legal team will claim that Grinnell's role was more extensive than previously known and that it corrupted the extradition process early on. The suggestion will be that the U.S. was so desperate to get Assange in its custody that American officials, via Grinnell, agreed in advance to take a particular sentence off the table before even allowing a trial and sentencing to play out. That is rather interesting. Uh, I didn't anticipate that being the case. Okay. Uh, Hmm. How interesting is that? Uh, The WikiLeaks founders' attorneys are also expected to present evidence that they believe shows Trump explicitly tasked Grinnell with making the offer, thereby politicizing the process. Hmm. Uh, I guess they don't love WikiLeaks that much over at uh, the Trump DOJ these days. All right. They, uh, They believe Trump explicitly tasked Grinnell with making the offer thereby politicizing the process. So, I mean, maybe he thought he was doing him a favor of some sort. It's like, well, take the death penalty. I mean, and why would he even be thinking about the death penalty if we love WikiLeaks? And does that really qualify as loving WikiLeaks to say, well, we won't execute your founder? That's that's kind of a 
a little bit of a tough love sort of a thing, I guess. Uh, let's see. The WikiLeaks founders' attorneys are also expected to present evidence that they believe shows Trump explicitly tasked Grinnell with making the offer, thereby politicizing the process. One of Assange's lawyers, Edward Fitzgerald, hinted at this argument in his opening statement on Monday. Uh, this would have been, uh, I guess, a week or two ago here, when he said that Assange's prosecution was not motivated by genuine concerns for criminal justice, but politics. The evidence submitted this week will include new materials submitted to Assange's legal team by political activist and journalist Cassandra Fairbanks. She's barely a journalist, but okay. A staunch defender of Assange, who has worked for the Russian state-run news site Sputnik, and the far-right outlet Gateway Pundit. She is expected to be listed as a formal witness in the case. So that's interesting. So now the Assange extradition hearings will include testimony from a well-known internet troll. Hmm. Fairbanks recorded two phone calls that she had with one of Grinnell's close associates, Arthur Schwartz. Anyone know him? And took screenshots of their conversations, because she's a troll, about Assange and Grinnell. She also gave the materials to the nonprofit transparency group Property of the People, which provided them to Politico. The screenshots and phone calls span from October 2018 to September of 2019. In them, Schwartz tells Fairbanks, why tell Fairbanks anything? I don't know. Schwartz tells Fairbanks that Grinnell was, quote, taking orders from the president when he got involved in facilitating Assange's arrest and urges her not to disclose what she's been told about Grinnell's role in the process. But Schwartz appeared to grow frustrated and fearful after Fairbanks tweeted on September 10th, 2019, that Grinnell, quote, was the one who worked out the deal for Julian Assange's arrest. I don't want to go to jail, Schwartz told Fairbanks in a September 2019 phone call, accusing her of posting classified information in a tweet. Fairbanks posted the tweet around the time Grinnell's name was being floated to replace John Bolton as Trump's national security advisor. I don't even remember that. Please, I'm begging you, Schwartz said in the recording. They look at you. They see that we speak. That's bad. I wouldn't mind Cassandra Fairbanks going to jail. And I don't really care about Schwartz. I don't know who that is. Grinnell's entry into the legal fight over Assange highlights the fact that in since-deleted tweets from 2016, he promoted the WikiLeaks disclosures targeting Democrats. Later, in April of 2017, then-CIA Director Mike Pompeo labeled the group a hostile intelligence service aided by Russia. Pompeo is everywhere and all over the map on all these things. And the suggestion that one of Grinnell's close associates who was not in government, may have been privy to conversations surrounding a sensitive law enforcement operation will likely raise more questions about his fitness to lead the entire U.S. intelligence community. What was he doing leaking to Schwartz, right? A spokesperson for the Office of the Director of National Intelligence did not return a request for comment. It's not clear whether Schwartz was actually privy to anything classified or whether Grinnell told Schwartz anything about his involvement in Assange's arrest. I highly doubt I would tell her anything real accurate or of any importance, Schwartz told Politico, adding that Fairbanks is not someone that I trust. I barely remember that conversation, Schwartz said. I don't know if that's a help or not. I remember that she was slinging mud at a friend of mine on social media and I wanted her to stop. Knowing that she's not too bright and easily manipulated, I threw a bunch of nonsense at her. Oh boy. That's not going to work. That I thought would get her to stop. And she did stop. Schwartz also said he did not recall chatting with Fairbanks over Signal, a secure messaging app. In written time, a written timeline Fairbanks provided to Assange's legal team that was also obtained by Politico, Fairbanks said Schwartz told her on October 30th, 2018, two weeks before prosecutors accidentally revealed in a court filing that DOJ had secretly filed criminal charges against Assange and nearly six months before Assange was arrested that the U.S. government would be going into the embassy to arrest him and implied that Ecuador would allow it to happen. That same month, Grinnell had secured Ecuador's cooperation with the arrest via the pledge for no death penalty, but his role was not revealed publicly until ABC News did so in April of 2019. I need to let Julian's lawyers and family know 
that the president personally ordered an anti-WikiLeaks ambassador from a country uninvolved in the case to secure Julian's arrest, Fairbanks told Schwartz on October 30th, 2018, via the encrypted messaging app Signal, according to screenshots provided to Politico. It's clear he's a political prisoner and his health is deteriorating rapidly. I don't know if it will matter to them, but it seems important and they should know. Schwartz was not sympathetic, but didn't dispute her claims as he sought to persuade her not to reveal the impending operation to Assange. I wouldn't get so emotional until you see exactly what that worthless piece of garbage did, he replied, referring to Assange. There's a good reason the death penalty was on the table. Fairbanks was incredulous. This is hard to unravel here because I hate so many of the people <laughs> involved in it. Uh, Fairbanks was incredulous. Are you sure it's not just Clinton friends taking some random photos and pinning it on him for revenge or something? I don't even know what that's supposed to mean. Forget about pictures, Schwartz replied, possibly suggesting that he had access to non-public information. There were other things that happened because he did what he did that led to horrible suffering and death. I have zero sympathy for him. Doubt you will either when slash if it comes out publicly. What is he trying to do here? Fairbanks visited Assange on March 27, 2019, roughly two weeks before his arrest, and relayed what she'd heard from Schwartz in October, she told Pierce. On March 29th, Schwartz told Fairbanks in another call obtained by Politico that there's an investigation now into people at state into who leaked Fairbanks the information about the operation. I'm sorry, she replied. Schwartz is well known in Washington, you believe it, as a Trump world fixer, uh-oh, they go to jail, who often criticizes journalists and other perceived enemies on his Twitter account. According to the New York Times, Schwartz is a central player in an effort to discredit news organizations deemed hostile to President Trump by publicizing damaging information about journalists. How odd that they're so gung-ho for getting a hold of Julian Assange, though. But last September, he appeared worried about being exposed himself. I don't want to go to jail, Schwartz told Fairbanks in the September call. Fairbanks denied posting anything classified, telling Schwartz that she had just been referring to the ABC News report from months earlier about Grinnell's role in the Assange operation. Schwartz was not convinced. Rick's role is classified, he said. You can't do that. You are posting things that are classified, that no one knows, that have not been reported. I know it's been reported. I see what you're tweeting. Uh, you're, what you're tweeting is not what was reported. Someone's going to go to jail. You need to stop this. Yeah, Julian's in jail right now because of this, replied Fairbanks. I don't want to go to jail, Schwartz retorted. Sounds like that's happening. All right, well, I'll delete my tweet only because you're saying you'll get in trouble, Fairbanks said. I don't want to go to jail, Schwartz repeated. Please, I'm begging you. They look at you. They see that we speak. That's bad. We've already heard about this one, right? More begging. Fairbanks agreed to delete the tweet, but retained a screenshot that was viewed by, reviewed by Politico. The materials will be introduced as soon as Wednesday, according to a person with direct knowledge in the legal strategy, and are just one piece of the argument that the U.S. criminal charges and extradition request for Assange stemmed from a political operative to get him at all costs. Imper I'm sorry, a political imperative to get him at all costs rather than a good faith legal process. I am sort of confused still as to why Trump would direct an effort to get Assange at all costs after all of the help he said WikiLeaks gave him in the election. And I mean, maybe it's just a matter of, well, he can connect it to me. We said that... Uh, we didn't involve ourselves with the Russians. The WikiLeaks people said that they denied, they played their part in denying that Russia was the source of the hacked DNC emails, which I, I don't think that they're denying that the Trump campaign got those emails from WikiLeaks. But I suppose if WikiLeaks, if under pressure, and on trial in the United States, they feared that Assange might change his story and break down and say, yes, we got them from Russia. And yes, we knew that they were getting we were getting them from Russia. And yes, so did the Trump campaign know that we were getting them from Russia. And they're lying if they say otherwise. 
then they would want him either first executed or in jail where they could at least say, you can't believe what he has to say. He's a convicted felon. I suppose that's a good explanation for how this happens. Let's get back to this here. Another big piece of that argument was presented by Assange's legal team last week when they submitted a statement from one of the one of WikiLeaks's lawyers claiming that Assange had been offered a pardon on Trump's behalf by California's then congressman Dana Rohrabacher. I guess he's got some interesting methods of I guess trying to silence Assange. We could execute you, that's one option. We could put you in prison and just say you're lying about us because you're a convicted felon, or we could pardon you and hope that you would feel like you owed us and therefore not reveal the truth about these things. This is a wild uh, range of ideas they came up with here. Assange would be pardoned, Rohrabacher allegedly claimed, if he would provide evidence that Russia was not WikiLeaks's source for the hacked DNC documents that the organization released in 2016. Rohrabacher acknowledged meeting with Assange, but said only that he promised to ask Trump to pardon the WikiLeaks founder if he could provide me information and evidence about who actually gave him the DNC emails. At no time did I offer a deal made by the president, nor did I say I was representing the president, Rohrabacher said in a statement. Ryan Shapiro, the executive director of Property of the People, said he wanted to release the Fairbanks materials now because they raised concerns about Grinnell's judgment. The Trump regime is consolidating power and the nation's new top spy is a former Fox News contributor and far-right public relations flack who appears to have leaked classified information to a Trump family political fixer who subsequently shared it with a prominent alt-right blogger, Shapiro said. Americans must confront the Trump regime's ongoing seizure of power or suffer the United States' descent into genuine authoritarianism. Uh, yeah, it's a problem, certainly, but it's weird that he's, uh, you know, I, I see what they're getting at there, but making common cause with Cassandra Fairbanks on anything is probably a recipe for trouble. But uh, I don't know. That's just kind of odd to have to try and unravel. <clears throat> It doesn't look to be breaking into the public consciousness in any widespread way such that it would stand. And, and I guess now with Trump thinking about other people to take on the job, maybe allegedly as DNI on a permanent basis, maybe it becomes irrelevant. But uh, I don't know. I think he's probably planning to just let Grinnell ride out the rest of the Trump administration, if he can, as acting director. Hmm. Uh, okay. Well, uh, moving on from there, there's a couple of other, uh, other interesting developments. The one I think we possibly have some time for here. Um, let's see. Oh, and I can provide to you, by the way, also some of the other, uh, articles, uh, for instance, on Grinnell's, uh, prior relationship with the Moldovan oligarch. I have uh, this piece here from when? The 21st, also from TPM. Uh, Trump's new spy chief used to work for a foreign politician in the U.S. accused of corruption. I think we made some mention of this the other day, but I'll bring that article back out. And uh, uh, by the way, just enter the name on the record here. In 2016, Grinnell wrote several articles defending the oligarch, a Moldovan politician named Vladimir Plahotniuc, I guess is my best stab at that last name, but did not disclose what, that he was being paid, according to records and interviews. Grinnell's all, Grinnell also did not register under the Foreign Agents Registration Act, which generally requires people to disclose work in the U.S. on behalf of foreign politicians. So that will cause another problem for him. But again, he doesn't have to come before the Senate for confirmation in this capacity anyway. So very little information likely to emerge between then and now. Now, uh, on another front, in case you were wondering what was going on here, the answer is not very much. Uh, the Hill reporting on February 24th, House panel says key witness isn't cooperating. Can you believe it? In probe into Jovanovich surveillance, John Bowden writes for The Hill. The House Foreign Affairs Committee said way back then on hmm, 
uh, whatever the Monday corresponding to 224 would have been, that a GOP congressional candidate who claimed to have the former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine under surveillance, remember him, Robert Hyde, is not cooperating with the committee's requests for information. How odd. Messages obtained by NBC News between the committee and Robert Hyde, a pro-Trump candidate for Congress in Connecticut, Greg's district, in fact, detail the committee's displeasure with Hyde's assertion in interviews that he had fully cooperated with the committee and claimed that significant gaps existed in records he provided to the committee. Hyde's connections with Lev Parnas and other associates of Rudy Giuliani, the president's lawyer and chief operative involved in his efforts to dig up dirt on his opponents, political opponents in Ukraine, were key to the now-shuttered impeachment inquiry targeting President, president Trump. Is it now shuttered entirely? I mean, for all intents and purposes, I guess that it is, but Democrats in the House should be protesting that it is not. But uh, that's another subject. They're simply not doing what they need to be doing in order to make any serious efforts at containing the president at this stage. I think they're pretty much giving up and just saying, we'll do it at the ballot box. Anyway, uh, Hyde is now also at the center of the Foreign Affairs Committee's probe into the State Department's response to alleged threats against Marie Ivanovich, the former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, seen by Trump allies as an obstacle into their efforts against former Vice President Joe Biden and his son Hunter in Ukraine. Text messages obtained by lawmakers found that Hyde provided Parnas with detailed information about Yovanovitch's whereabouts in Ukraine. In the emails obtained by NBC, Hyde responds to the committee's requests for more information and demands that he be allowed to watch while investigators reviewed his electronic devices, citing alleged corruption in the FBI. Hmm. I'm a nobody that has come from nothing and that loves his country. And now all caps, I'm not sure how or why I'm being used in this hoax or whatever you call it, but it's disgusting trying to set me up. I submitted everything I have, Hyde wrote in one email. It's starting to become apparent that you and the FBI is hmm, trying to set me up with false or fake evidence aimed at hurting his congressional bid, Hyde said, of course, yes. A spokesman for the Foreign Affairs Committee declined to comment to NBC on the messages. So, okay, that's very interesting. Uh, I suppose, once again, subpoena power uh, at stake here and the House still reluctant, naturally, to rely on inherent contempt authority and no sign uh, of their being interested in doing so anytime in the near future. Uh, no time to get through it today, but uh, you may have seen, and I guess now would be a good time to remind you if you didn't get a chance to take a look at it, Brian Boitler writing a few days Prior to that, back on February 19th, his piece in Crooked, House Democrats stand down. And, you know, essentially he's right about that. That's where we are. After Senate Republicans voted to conceal the evidence of Donald Trump's high crimes and acquit him of them without holding a real trial. You remember that? House Democrats seemed to understand that he'd interpret the outcome not as a chastening brush with accountability, but as permission to commit further crimes unbound. We're going to have to be vigilant in Congress. We're going to have to do everything we can to defend the institutions of our democracy as long as we're forced to suffer his presence in the Oval Office and the threat that he poses, said Adam Schiff, the lead impeachment manager, of course. The senators who found him guilty but nevertheless voted to acquit, I don't think lived up to their oath to be impartial jurors, but that doesn't relieve us of our obligation to defend our democracy when it's at great risk. As Schiff spoke these words, Trump had already begun to assert dictatorial powers in acts of vengeance and impunity, and I think we all know what a lot of those examples were. He has since purged the administration of many of the impeachment witnesses uh, in order to cow anyone in the executive branch who's contemplated exposing his corruption into silence. He's connived with Attorney General Bill Barr to provide special leniency to his criminal associates, who face prison time for obstructing the Russia investigation. His administration began feeding his loyalists in Congress derogatory confidential information about Joe Biden's son so that they could do to one of Trump's domestic enemies what the Ukrainian government did not. 
And his most predictable trick will come when Barr, who has asserted sign-off rights on all matters Trump cares about, inevitably lets slip that the presumptive Democratic nominee, whoever it may be, is under investigation. That Trump now feels liberated to reach into the justice system to help his friends and harass his enemies was entirely foreseeable and indeed foreseen. But House Democrats have not demonstrated the vigilance Schiff promised. You're not getting your oversight, in other words. Something I've been saying for quite a long time, like a decade or more now. Quite the opposite, in fact. And in abdicating their duty to be vigilant, they have left the country in greater danger than it would face if they took their powers, let's say, more seriously. And he goes on to further explain exactly what their options may be and how much of them they are not exercising. I'll allow you to read through that on your own. We'll be back tomorrow for the last show of the week. Time now to hand things over to Justice Putnam for the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Let's see what he's got on the agenda that we haven't covered. Of course, more talk about the coronavirus, which we did cover, but you can never have enough. And check this one out. Citing government overreach, three Republicans voted against the bill that makes lynching, at long last, a federal crime. From Daily Co's Radio, on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to the k in the Morning Show. With David Waltman. All right, in other news, Congress warns the Trump administration not to take more money for the border wall. We'll see how well that one works. And a Roger Stone juror clapped back at Trump for denigrating the concept of equal justice. And, of course, big day for international news. You can always take a tour around the world with the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy coming up right here next.